Gates, the most utilized and familiar means of time travel throughout Chrono Trigger. When the first one opens up during Luca's telepod experiment, it clued us into just how interesting of a gaming experience we were in for. As the story goes on, we jump through countless more, and eventually, they become sort of a background game mechanic, and we begin taking them for granted. The degradation of their importance only intensifies when we obtain the Epoch, and can bypass their use entirely. I've seen a few playthroughs that didn't even fill in all of the Pillars of Light at the end of time, since doing so requires re-entering the gate at Bangor Dome, one you haven't likely thought of for quite some time, and then going back through the pillar to retrieve your time machine. Despite this apparent uselessness by gameplay standards, gates are insanely important to the story of Chrono Trigger, and carry with them their own sort of mystique. There are many different types, colors, and interactions with each that never fails to capture my imagination. In this video, we'll be going over each of these unique properties, which gates they pertain to, and why. First, let's talk about where the gates come from and why they appear. The first hint we get is at the very beginning, when Marl's pendant seems to react to the energy of the telepod, shorting it out and making the gate materialize. After Marl is drawn in and the gate closes, Luca suggests that the pendant must have been the cause, as it could not have been the telepod alone. You grab the pendant, she juices it up for you, and the gate reappears, seeming to validate her hypothesis. This marks the first of Luca's theories, which, while based on rational thought and a decent amount of evidence, both end up being wrong. That doesn't stop her from somehow being able to manufacture the gate key, with similar technology to the telepod, allowing actual control over the gate's opening and closing. Now, obviously, the energy from the telepod was what forced the gate open, but was not the cause of its existence in the first place. As we carry on through the game, what could be considered her revised gate theory, comes after Lavos's fall in prehistory. She surmises that the incredible power of Lavos distorts time and creates gates. A solid theory, considering one appears immediately after his crash landing in the middle of the resulting crater, but still not quite correct. It's not until after completing the side quest to save Fiona's forest, when a far more cohesive theory is presented. Robo, having had 400 years of constant rumination on the subject, suggests the existence of an entity, who he believes to be the cause of the gates appearing. Further, the party adds to this by citing how people remember their most prominent experiences just before the point of death, and that perhaps that is what the entity is doing through the use of time travel. The true form of the entity is never revealed to us, but it is heavily implied that it is the planet itself reliving its memories as it dies, and Lavos playing an instrumental role in its death. There are many events that lend more evidence to this idea of the entity being responsible for the gates, but we'll cover that as it comes up. Different gate colors and what they mean. The typical and most widely occurring gates are the blue ones we use to hop back and forth between time periods. They seem to exist in the same position in both eras that connect them, such as Lean Square to Truce Canyon, the crater to the 12,000 BC cave, and so on. There are a few of these gates that appear to be one way, in the sense that they are only accessible from the end of time's light pillars and don't seem to have counterparts in different eras. Namely, the gate in prehistory which floats in the air, and the one in the closet that takes the party to Medina Village. Those seem to be the exception rather than the rule, however, and we can assume that the counterpart gates for them are simply useless to the party once the end of time becomes a sort of time traveler's rest stop. Probably the most interesting gate is the red one that Luca steps into while the party sleeps. This gate, in particular, validates Robo's hypothesis that the entity creates them to aid Kerno and Co. As before it appears, the point in time Marl asks Luca she would want to return to is the very time to which this gate connects, 990 AD. The entity, likely sympathizing with Luca, gave her the opportunity to change the past in a meaningful way. The event where Luca's mother loses her legs was obviously a formative moment in her life, and resulted in her studying machines to avoid further accidents. The gate takes her to the very second where Lara's skirt becomes stuck in the conveyor belt, and Luca has the chance to enter the password, avoiding her mother's injury. Whether she chooses to do so is entirely up to the player, and I love it. Not to harp too much on this point, but the way in which the game does this is brilliant. For the entirety of our adventure, we've been changing history for the express purpose of defeating Lavos and saving the future. 
And then, out of the blue, we are given the choice to selfishly change something that would result in a better life for one of our character's family, or let history continue as it is written and accept that not everything works out the way we want. Just, wow, man. Anyway, the Red Gate only appears once in the game, and if I had to define its attributes, I'd start with its lifespan. It only seems to be very temporarily active, and disappears the moment we exit, having made our choice. This further intensifies the importance of our decision, knowing that once we make it, there's no going back. This entire scene seems to be on a time crunch. The speed of the conveyor belt, the running around to figure out the password, and finally, not knowing how long the gate will stay open. All that being said, I would say that the Red Gate signifies a very personal destination, and an equally short amount of time to spend there. Finally, there is the Green Gate, which only appears at the start of A New Game Plus, and leads directly to Labos. This one doesn't seem to take us to any particular time period, as the multiple endings that can be witnessed by defeating Labos through it are widely considered to be alternate realities independent of the canon. If the theory of Labos' pocket dimension is true, which we'll discuss another time, then we can assume that the green color indicates a destination that exists outside of time and space, which is not the end of time. Whether or not this gate is even canon to exist in the Chrono Trigger universe is unknown, but I still think it is relevant to this conversation about gate colors and their purpose. Alright, let's move on to some of the weirder style of gates and what their purpose seems to be, starting with the ones at the end of time. The Pillars of Light are not called gates at any point in the game, but rather that they link up to different eras. Judging by the way you fall from or rise into the space above them depending on arrival or departure, might signify that the actual gates are floating in the ether of the end of time, above the noir-style walkways Gaspar somehow created with his magic. While pillars themselves are not gates per se, I felt the need to include them here, as when you use one, you are warped in the same fashion as if you entered a standard time portal. The other gate available to us at the end of time is kept in a bucket near Specchio's room. This bucket leads directly to 1999 AD at the exact moment of Labos' eruption, giving you just enough time to run in and save the day. This gate also appears to be floating in the ether, and opens in a normal way once you arrive at the day of Labos. However, a unique property of this particular warp is a darkening flicker as you travel through it. We can likely assume this is because the power of Labos is strong enough to interfere with time and space itself. Or that, since 1999 AD is where the planet meets its fate, that this is the racing heartbeat of the entity, knowing how important your success is to the future, and becoming anxious. A similar flicker occurs when we jump through the gate within Labos' shell which the entity likely made for poor souls feeling unprepared for the final confrontation, to flee and rethink their strategy. Moving away from the end of time, let's talk about the gate that opens in Magus's castle when he summons Labos. This one is tricky. Number one, it's massive. Much bigger and stronger than any gate we've seen thus far, and envelops all of the fortress along with the party and Magus. When we first arrive at the end of time, Gaspar explains to us that when more than four beings enter a portal, the conservation of time theorem says they'll end up at the space-time coordinates of least resistance. In other words, travel in groups of three or you might mess stuff up, as we saw with the proto-dome gate shorting out and bringing us to the end of time. The laws of time travel don't seem to apply to the gate in Magus's castle, however, as it sucks up four beings and an entire structure, sending Magus to 12,000 BC and the rest of us to be nursed back to health in prehistory. As we'll talk about in a moment, Labos, although not the cause of Gates, does seem to have the ability to create them, or at least impose his power so heavily that it affects time in detrimental ways. Perhaps this gate was created by Labos, and that is why it has such strange features. Or it was yet another made by the entity to aid the party. If that were the case, you would think it would send you to the end of time just as a safety measure. But perhaps the summoning of Labos caused the entity to have to act out of desperation, and did not allow enough time for dictating the gate's destination. It's all a big mystery, and we may never know the true answer to this one. Next, we'll discuss the black portals that opened up in the original Ocean Palace disaster before we arrived in 12,000 BC to affect it. These are the ones that swallowed up the three gurus and Janus, spitting them out into seemingly random eras. Now, as I thought when I first played the game, 
It wouldn't be a stretch to think that Labos caused these portals to appear, either by design or, again, as a side effect of his power. He even makes small movements with his face when each opens, further suggesting that they were his doing. Here's the rub, however. Why would Lavos have sent them off through portals rather than destroy them then and there? And if it was just a side effect of his powers, why would these gates come out at specific points where gates we assume the entity created were already present? This is why I feel that these gates, like the others, were likely the entities doing once again. Sending the gurus to the eras they appear in was obviously a smart move as this made it possible for each of them to survive, and for the party to interact with them, benefiting their journey. Melchior repairing the mass moon, Gaspar becoming the end of time's caretaker, and Belthazar inventing the epoch, and the means with which to scale Death Peak. Magus's arrival in the Middle Ages was also well thought out, as, whether he joined you or not, he would eventually inform the team of the existence of a guru of time who could help resurrect Chrono. The only blind spot here is Shala's teleportation to the darkness beyond time, which we never see take place. As for how she wound up there, I don't know. Perhaps it was because she was so connected with Lavos, presumably being an arbiter for the Frozen Flame, that whatever portal the entity tried to use for her resulted in such a destination. But who knows. Another interesting style of gate, which we see once or twice, is the one Dalton opens up to summon his golems. These are less time gates, and are more likely interdimensional in nature, pulling creatures from wayward planes to do his bidding. Though he is not the only one capable of this, as Queen Zeal summons creatures from similar spaces to fight. Either way, after we defeat the golem boss and lay into him, Dalton is swallowed up by his own portal, and we don't see him for the rest of the game. There is a confirmed continuation of his story, but that's for another video. A character spotlight, maybe? The final gate we will discuss is probably the most interesting out of the bunch. With Gaspar's time egg in hand, and the means with which to climb Death Peak at our disposal, we fight our way to the summit in the hopes of resurrecting Chrono. The Chrono Trigger hatches, and a huge black gate appears, eclipsing what little sunlight pokes through the dusty clouds of 2300 AD. This, like the Red Gate, seems to bring us only to a very specific point in time, and for a very short moment namely the Ocean Palace disaster, at exactly the moment when Chrono sacrificed himself. The difference is, we witnessed something that was not thought possible, a time freeze, giving us the unique opportunity to pull Chrono from history and replace him with a clone, saving him and yet preserving the timeline even in his absence. There's not much to say about this gate, except that it is unlike any other we have seen in the game, and we don't see another like it again. Presumably, if we were to have another Chrono Trigger time egg, we could climb Death Peak once more and reopen it, or even materialize a different one that could send us to an entirely separate time, frozen in place just the same, but that is unlikely. It's stated by Gaspar that the time egg, while it was needed to be the catalyst for the game, was not all that was required for such an event to take place. Determination and importance to space-time is also a prerequisite for resurrecting a lost loved one. Otherwise, anyone could do it. Luckily, Chrono and the party fit that description to a T, and we were able to realize the full potential of the Chrono Trigger. Well, that's it for this one. I hope you have a bit more appreciation for Gates and their many permutations as a result of this video. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time.